Hello and welcome everybody to the NBA Show Reviews. This time we're going to review episode 19 of season 4, episode 84 overall, For Whom the Sweet Belt Toils, written by Dave Polsky. This is James Cork and with me I have my good friend and co-host, Norman Sanso. Hello guys, hello James. Hey Norman, how's it going? Oh, fine, I mean, fine as fine can be, I guess. <laughs> there is not much change between this one and the previous one because for those of you who listened to the previous episode review we are recording these last three episodes one after the other but for the people of the world of tomorrow we are going to make them separate that way you don't have to get through one review in order to get to the one that you really want to listen you can just skip to the next video and stop listening to our silly voices mm -hmm. so okay this episode this episode was promoted like I have never seen before. The only time I have seen an episode get so much uh, so much buzz was when Trixie was coming back in season 3 mm -hmm. where they were releasing teasers, they were releasing uh, videos, they were releasing everything and they were just non-stop talking about it just talking, talking, talking and I'm like, oh my god what is going to happen in this episode? Is it going to be to live up to the hype? Is it going to disappoint everybody? Or is it going to just be the middle of the road and just an okay, mediocre episode? <laughs> well, I like to save my opinion for last because I like to stay on top of everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to give the, I'm going to give the uh, spotlight to Norman and then from Norman I will pick it up. All righty then. So Norman, what did you think of, of this episode? Well, this one is another hard episode for me to point out with the previous one. I think this is the first for me back-to-back -back episode where I didn't know what to think. Seriously? Yeah, seriously. Because you, you weren't even like that with Simple Ways, which, in my no, opinion, I think that was the one episode you were, you were having the most trouble with. Um, yeah, I mean, Simple Ways had its issue because of the whole morality thing. But after you explain it, I kind of didn't have a problem. With this one, I know the beat of what they're trying to tell. I, I know the lessons and everything. But the way they, they told it, how do I put this? This kind of episode is a pet peeve of mine where certain misunderstandings and certain stuff didn't create conflict. It's one of my pet peeves, not talking bad about the show. It's just a personal preference of mine when shows do certain things like this. But I do love the princess in this and I do love Sweetie Belle, so there's nothing to hate. And my favorite main six is here. Well, one of the main six I like, but yeah, still. Let me stop you right there, because I think you are misunderstanding the concept of misunderstanding. You don't know what misunderstanding is. Kind of, but I, I don't no, know. No, no, you don't, no, you really don't know, because in this episode there is no misunderstanding in this episode. There is lack of information. Here is the thing. The, what happens in this episode is that the, the characters act, or one of them acts, according to a lack of information, not the fact that she doesn't have... She has all the information and she misinterprets it. Like the way that misunderstandings were, misunderstandings were handled in, in movies like Shrek or in every other uh, high school drama movie ever made, with the, actually all the exception of Equestria Girls, mm. in that we're going to get these people angry or these characters are angry at each other because they have the information but they are misinterpreting it. Mm. It, this is not Final Fantasy XIII. There is no misunderstanding here. This is just a lack of information. The, 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 don't get it wrong, because the way that... I know what you're talking about. You're talking about the scene where they go flashback and they check... They, they see Sweetie Belle's fifth birthday. Uh, yeah. And Sweetie Belle see, thinks that her sister is taking all of the spotlight. And that's where where she is like, ah, oh, that's where I never... I, I learned not to, not to trust my sister anymore. And Luna is like, maybe you don't have the whole story. You don't know what was going on with your sister. And Suitable clearly made a point not to, uh, not to pay attention to that. That's why they go back and that's why they show Rarity's side to show that Rarity was doing the things she was doing during Suitable's birthday party to avoid, the, to prevent the, 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 the other Phyllis and Colts to leave the party. And not only that, but she gives her credit for the party favors that she was using to keep them in, to keep them in the party. Well, okay, maybe, um, Maybe I just misunderstood what I was trying to say, oh, but, but still. You know what? I know exactly what you mean. Because yeah. the misunderstanding trope is my least favorite. Yeah. Like, it's the trope that I just cannot stand. Yeah. It's, not the, it's not the most. 
Like, I think my least favorite trope is the, that uh, authority figures have to... That's not a word! Uh, yeah. Which is, is something that really gets me, makes me sick. Mm. But, yeah, I mean, it is not a misunderstanding. And this show has had misunderstandings. The whole conflict of the Canterlot wedding, that is, that is based on a misunderstanding. Well, maybe I'm just um, misunderstood. <laughs> Uh, okay, that sounds funny if I say no, it No, you're confusing, you're confusing yeah. one trope to another, that's yeah, fine. Maybe I'm confusing There's one no trope problem. to another, yeah. yeah but still, yeah. but still, I mean, we, at least you understand what I mean. But So anyway, let, let's move on, James. Uh, we, do, we don't need to hang up over, on, I over the No, we, you know what? The thing is that I, it, it would be unfair if people don't, uh, if people mistake one trope for another in the fact that, okay, we have this, we, we have this event where uh, Sweetie learns that her mistake has been a huge one because she wasn't she was misjudging her sister and that happened several times that is the entire basis of the episode is that Sweetable wants to have Rarity to help her make those dresses and make them make them good and Rarity makes the dresses as best as she can because she wants to help her sister mm-hmm. the thing is that everything else that her sister has done when compared to what Rarity uh, has been working on is not up to snotch. Mm, true, true. It doesn't. It doesn't have the same level of quality, and Sweetable takes that as Rarity trying to take the spotlight. Yeah, true. Because little sisters are like that. Little sisters can. Little sis, not sisters, but siblings in general. They can be like that. They can be stupid. They can misinterpret the intentions of the big brother or the big sister. Mm-hmm. I, understand. I have. I have been there. <laughs> oh, you're not the only one, man. But still, but still, it's one of those situations where. Big brother or big sister knows best. And in this case where Rarity helps Sweetie Belle with the costume design, and oh my, the costume that Sweetie Belle did, it was bad. But Rarity here did the best that she could for the play. And unfortunately enough, the play was a bit too big for Sweetie Belle and the CMCs. Well, the way the way the the plays seem to be written, like you know, old in English, mm. with with apparently not all that good costumes and all that, and then Rarity fixes one mist- one thing in it, uh, mm. because she wants to do the best for her sister because it's her sister, which forces her to cut down the uh, to cut down with, with with her own project that has to go out in the morning in Manhattan. That is that is a lot of work. Like Rarity has been busting her ass in order to make this project work, and then Suitable goes and and sabotages <coughs> one of her uh, one of her clothes, mm-hmm. the the most important piece of them all, oh, yeah. just because she thought that Rarity wanted to take the spotlight the same way she did on her fifth uh, <laughs> fifth, ver- fifth birthday, and that happens. I mean, that is that is so common. If you have or if you have younger siblings. And you are just doing your thing uh, as, a, as an older sibling. If, if you have younger siblings, your your parents or even themselves, they're going to compare themselves with you. And they're going to say, I want to be as good as you and I want to be as good as, as, as the thing. I want to do as awesome things as you do. And then the things that you do start to catch the spotlight. It goes to a point where they stop being admiring and they start being jealous. Oh yeah. And they start to get envy, and they start to become like uh, this. It starts to form this big ball of jealousy that ends up exploding. Oh. And it, it, and that's where where sibling rivalry rivalry starts. Mm-hmm. And uh, sadly, when when you are a kid, you don't have a magical princess of the night that goes into your <laughs> dreams and teaches you a lesson. Uh, but. You can you can count with uh, you can count on people to help you out with that. Least least of all your parents or even your older uh, your older sibling. Mm-hmm. That's true. That's true. Yeah, it's true. It's true. I mean, being part of a sibling or a family with siblings, it's hard because number one is always going to be looked up upon by the parents, and number two and so on are going to be compared. What well, is Usually it's going to be, why couldn't you be like Big Brother or Big Sister? Oh, why couldn't you do this? Why couldn't you do that like Big Brother or Big Sister? I mean, it's always going to be that way. And I I can understand Sweetie Belle's point of view, where Big Sister is trying to take over her limelight because she worked hard on the play. And the only thing that other people remember from the play was the dress. 
Nothing about the play, nothing about the acting, nothing about the directing, nothing about the script writing or acting. Just the dress. Which, if you were in her position, you'll get pissed too. Of course. Of course you would. Mm-hmm. Hell, sometimes it can be like like the other way around. It doesn't need to be like older sibling, uh, younger sibling. It can just be siblings. Like, sometimes the, your younger sibling will do something better than you, and you're, you are kind of like, not jealous, but you are kind of like a bit discouraged because the things that you're doing are not as, as impressive or amazing as the the ones your, your your other brother or sister is doing, and you are like, oh, damn it, I want to be as best as, as he or she, but wait, I can't. Like, mm. I cannot do better than this. And then they're getting all of the spotlight. And, and that's that's the core of the episode, because it's seen from the perspective of uh, Rarity as an, as an older sister, Sweetie Belle as a younger sister, and Luna as a younger sister that had a conflict with her older sister mm. that was so bad, it almost put the entire land in peril for like forever. Uh, to the point that she actually had to be banished to the moon just because she couldn't control her emotions. Mm. Something that we saw on the season four uh, premiere and something that we saw resolved on the season one premiere. It's uh, sisterhood and the rivalry that comes with uh, having uh, brothers or sisters is one of the main plot threads that goes through the entire a TV show like we have Applejack with um, with Apple Bloom, we have Rarity with Sweetie Belle, we have Shining Armor with Twilight, uh, we have Celestia with Luna. We have the whole th- that, that those those stories that even though they are not as developed as many people want to, they are still there. They are beating. They are, they, they, they are alive. They are moving and they are implemented in a very organic way and very realistically. Yeah, you know what? I haven't said uh, what I th- what I thought about this episode. Um, I didn't I didn't even say that, but I am just here praising on it. And you may imagine that I really liked it. And yeah, I don't think you liked it as much as I did. I do like it. Yeah, but but definitely not as much as I did because if you think the episode is very good, I thought the episode was great. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is uh, this is going up on my list as another another round ten out of ten episode. Along the lines of the season premiere, uh, they're in Don't Power Ponies, Rarity Takes Manhattan, Bats, Philly Vanilli, and uh, it's just so good, so mm. intense, so, so surprisingly not funny. Oh, yeah, that's this, true. This episode, this episode had no comedy in it. Well, it had comedy, but compared to the drama, compared oh, yeah. to the conflict, compared to the, to the nightmare, it, it was nothing. It, it like the, the, yeah, I mean, the, there were a couple of like funny tidbits here and there, but the whole thing is an absolute drama. Mm-hmm. I, I was surprised. I was thinking about it when the episode was over, and I was thinking, oh my god, there is no comedy on this episode. It's all about dra- it's, it's it's a massive twenty-two minute long Greek tragedy. <laughs> it's it's just so so sad and shocking and intense. It's like that. that I, I use the word intense, but that's what it is. I mean. When, as soon as the dream starts and, and Sweetie Belle uh, falls asleep after ruining Rarity's headdress, mm-hmm. that's where the episode goes from uh, 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 dramatic to downright nightmarish oh, and, yeah. and incredibly dark. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think I have to say this. When we entered the nightmare part, that is the part where I enjoyed the episode because from the beginning to that part, it kind of didn't caught me because it's one of those episodes where, oh, why must you be revenge? I, I, uh, revenge, no, I, I don't like, no. Well, yeah. revenge in what sense? Yeah, you know, where Sweetie Belle um, took out the thread for the headpiece. So that part, I, I didn't like it because maybe this speaks for me in my personal person- personality where... If you're not good enough, there's no point in backstabbing or doing revenge. You try to do better or um, learn from your mistakes and try to do better. And uh, I think this is yeah, personal but that's personality. What you're thinking, you're yeah. thinking it right now when you are like older, you're more mature and you yeah, have more yeah, life yeah. experience. When you are a kid, you're stupid. You want the easy way out. You want the fast way out. You want to have revenge. You want to get back at your brother, your friend, your mother, your do, your, your your aunt, your whatever. You want to get back to the person 
that you think hurt you. Mm -hmm. And you don't care who's on the way. You just want to get revenge. Mm -hmm. And it feels so good when you're doing it. It feels so good that you suddenly feel like you can't fall asleep. But the best part is that in Sleepless in Ponyville, we were shown how Luna is there to protect Scootaloo from her nightmares. Mm -hmm. Because Scootaloo's nightmares, they come from, uh, we can say, an unfair place mm, yeah. in that she's scared of something that is not real mm -hmm. and she should be protected from something that, that, that's not there. So, of course, <laughs> Luna has the ability to walk in your dreams and destroy your nightmares when you don't deserve it. Mm -hmm. But when you're a vengeful little... That's not a word! ...like Sweetie is in this episode, she has all the right to throw you into the most terrible nightmares hell that you can imagine and she does i mean as soon as during the dream sequence when rarity goes to bed mm -hmm. the scene goes in negative oh yeah. and that's when luna gives sweetie bell a preview of the future oh yeah. and those moments it, it's i think it's not even one minute long but it's, it feels eternal because you you see Rarity presenting the headdress to Sapphire Shores, and Sweetie Belle tries to move, and she can't because she has oh, her yeah. hooves stuck to the ground, and she's trying to move, and she can't. And the headdress is a disaster. Everybody loves at Rarity. Rarity is just crying, mm -hmm. and, and 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 Sweetie Belle starts starts to fall. That one, that one, really classic trope of dreams where you fall down when you're suffering a nightmare, and you're just like you you want to get out, but you can't because and you are still falling. And we see Rarity just going insane, losing herself. Fluttershy goes to ask her for a dress. Rarity says that she doesn't do them anymore. And you see the inside of 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 Carousel Boutique. Rarity is in there. There is spider webs all over the place. She's deranged. Her eyes are bloodshot. She's she, her mane is all frazzled. She's just she just she just went mad. She lost her mind and Sweetie Belle is screaming, wake me up, Princess Luna, wake me up, wake me up. And I am like, I'm here like the nostalgia critics saying, Jesus Christ, is this for children? This isn't a kid's show. This is like, yeah, I repeat the word, this is intense. Like, oh God, I was watching the episode and I, I, I was shocked. Uh, the, 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 the immersion of this, uh, of this dream sequence is so powerful mm -hmm. it's so well done it feels like a dream where where she's when she's falling down the stairs and she goes from one dream to another and then she falls from that uh, like that kind of like star trampoline and she falls into the water and it trans it it, it transfers between the it, it kind of lo like goes between dreams mm -hmm. because you see that the dolphins that later on show up in Sapphire Shore's uh, headdress at the end of the episode. Mm -hmm. So it's like it transferring from it goes from from Sapphire Shore's dreams into Rarity's uh, 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 past. Yeah, or future. And it's like the transitions during that dream sequence are amazing. Oh well, yeah. And it, it lures you in because they are very calm, they're very peaceful, and then bam, a sledgehammer of of dark and, and, and grim right to your face. Okay, I am monopolizing the review again, but I just wanted to say that when my sister and I watched the episode, I had already watched it, but she hadn't. And when we were watching the episode, she was sinking into her chair, <laughs> both hands together before her mouth, like silent, looking at the screen, not blinking. And she's she's 18 years old, okay? She's 18 years old. At that age, people are very cynical. They're very, um, they think they know everything, and they are like very brainy. Even even my sister does. But that scene left her like stuck to the chair. She couldn't move. She didn't. She didn't even like. There, there were a couple of jokes afterwards. She didn't laugh. She wasn't laughing. She was suffering, and I loved it. I was like, oh, yes, this is great. Because I was kind of seeing myself when I watched the episode for the first time. Mm -hmm. it, it gets so bad, that final climax, that I thought they were going to fail. There is a big possibility that they are going to fail, especially when they manage to fix and recover the headdress. Sapphire Shores is saying that she's very concerned about Rarity's attitude, and that's not going to work out. It's like it's a constant struggle and a constant pain. To go through the entire episode until the, the, the very satisfying and very happy conclusion where sister and sister get reunited, everything is fine, and Princess Luna is happy that she managed to save the relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is true, that is true. I mean, the whole episode from starting from the dream sequence, 
I, I think for me, when it went to the dream sequence, it, it went good for me because the whole scene, I, if you remember right, what Megan said during um, her tweets about this episode, that there's a part where she's really proud of it because the whole sequence was really awesome. And yeah. I think it was the dream sequence. Yeah, awesome visuals, according to her uh, on her Twitter. And it it does. I mean, those transitions are so well done that there is a lot of flow. There is no cuts. There is no editing. They go in one in the same animation uh, sequence from one to another, and it's like there is there is no um. And there is no way of telling where one dream ends and one dream uh, starts. Yeah, because if you, like you said before, where Rarity, no, sorry, where Sweetie Belle went through dreams, like in the first place where Luna brought her into her dreams or into her past. And then from that point where she changes perspective to Rarity, that transition where she did that, that was awesome. And it was now in Rarity's mind. And after that, when they transition to another scene or the part where describing the future or predicting the future, where she fell, where Sweetie Belle fell into the lake of dolphins, that was in Sapphire Shore's dreams. I, I, I do like the whole sequence. If you didn't really notice it, like you were wondering, why are there dolphins here? Okay, what? Whatever. And then you watch the episode again and you are you remember what Sapphire Shore says about her dolphins being her lucky animal that they yeah. appear in her dreams. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> that's when you realize Luna went between dreams. She she transferred Sweetable <laughs> through Sapphire Shores and then they went into rarities. That is very clever. No, but that's really Really clever. I mm-hmm. really like it. I mean, the way they use the dreamscape is so smart because they, everybody has a, a lucky animal, lucky uh, uh, charm, like, like whatever. And uh, they may show up in your dreams, yes or no, but that's wonderful that they use it and they use it to a very, uh, a very good measure. Uh, the, the dolphin motif appears also during the future predictions where Sapphire Shores is starting to mock rarity and you can see that the screen has dolphins on it. After watching the episode and loving it and enjoying it so much, then the cynic in me, because I, everybody has one, and mine is a tiny, all crotchety, wrinkly man that looks like Mickey Rooney. He looks like Mickey Rooney. He's, he has a cane and he's angry. You have to say something negative about this episode. And then, first of all, I shut that down because I had nothing. I have no complaints about this episode. Like I said, 10 out of 10. But, but I had to agree with something that the cynic side in me said. And that's the... This episode is written by Dave Polsky. Uh-huh, yeah. This episode is written by the guy that pretty much botched an entire Wild West cowboy episode in season one. I wouldn't say that per se for me. I didn't uh, think it was that bad. Uh, I, thought, I thought Over a Barrel is definitely one of the worst episodes of the entire series. And nothing that comes is going to make me change my mind. I think that episode is, uh, is, is, is completely unnecessary from the moment that they leave the train. And it made me wary of anything if Polsky could work in the future. And I really wasn't looking forward to seeing his name again in this TV show. And I am being completely honest here. I really didn't want to have Dave Polsky come back in any of the episodes. And it wasn't until Too Many Pinkie Pies that I started to like get a feel to the kind of writing he does. You cannot get a measure of you cannot get a good measure of a writer's worth if you only see two episodes. Mm. The, the same way we cannot measure how Chris Savino is a good writer by just seeing Bose Busters and the Stair Master. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the same way we cannot say how good Scott, Son, Scott Sonborn or Michel Benvenuti are just by the one episode that they have written for this season. Mm-hmm. The, the same with Betsy McGowan with Power Ponies. Is like you, you need to give them time. And the one thing that Dave Polsky does so great, the thing that he did in, uh, and now that I think about it, he also did it in Feeling Pinky King. He did it in Too Many Pinky Pies. He did it in uh, the few parts that were left of Spike at Your Service. On Keep Calm and Flutter On, on Games Ponies Play, Dead in Don't, Rarity Takes Me in Hatton, Twilight Time, and this episode... And hopefully he'll do it again on 
on the one about the, the uh, Equestria games coming up, mm-hmm. right before the season finale, the one thing that Dave Polsky does better than any other writer in the show, he makes the characters sound human. They sound like real people. They don't talk like, they don't use ultra complicated scientific terms. They don't go, uh, uh, they don't try to like, sound, they don't sound pretentious. They don't uh, go on a tirade of words, words like I'm doing right now. Their dialogue flows great. They use normal words. This is the best part. I think his best character that he writes for is Rarity. <laughs> well, I, I do agree with you, James, where you, you can't judge a person by their writing or just how much they write. Because, come on, if we are to judge a person by their writing, then Lauren Fox just did too. And why are people praising her? No, well, people are praising her because she created the, 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 the design document, the all so-called show Bible that has all the... Uh, has a good list of characters, list of cities, the basic rules of how ponies should act in Equestria, and all of that. But if we are going to talk about how an episode is written, she's not very good. In this regard, she is like George Lucas. And I don't (laughs) care if people are going to throw tomatoes at my face because you're going to listen to this. Because George Lucas is awesome when it comes to creating worlds, but he sucks the big one when it comes to develop them. Oh, true that. I I do hear that. Yeah, yeah. It's like, imagine a farmer, okay? A farmer that uh, grows orange trees, okay? Mm -hmm. And he is the best at growing orange trees. He has the best orange trees in the world, okay? But then he harvests the orange, the oranges. And then when it, when it comes to making the orange juice, he sucks. Mm -hmm. He completely botches it. The, The orange juice is filled with pulp and and seeds and it's nasty and it's not sweet it's salty and it's like what the hell happened here <laughs> so but then what george lucas did in the first star wars movies is that he surrounded himself with a bunch of people very very good talented people that developed the universe for him mm-hmm. and that's why the spin-off games work so well that's why the the the, the, the alternate the, the extended universe of star wars works so well the same way that Lauren Faust set up this TV show mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. she led a bunch of writers really good at it. Amazing animators, fantastic voice actors, mm-hmm. super talented music composers work on it and develop the universe for her. Mm, so that's true. why I don't get, I can't get people who don't like the show because they, uh, they don't like the way it's going. I can get people that, they don't like the show because they got angry with someone and thinking about the show reminds them of that someone, so now they hate the show. I can I can understand all of those people, but I cannot comprehend the Lauren Faust fanatics, can uh-huh. we say? Yeah, yeah. I cannot understand that pe- those people. I don't want to dwell deeper into this because we are reviewing uh, For Whom the Suitable Toils. But yeah, yeah, I mean, true, true. Yeah, we, the, back to the topic, we cannot judge a writer for just a couple of episodes. Mm-hmm. We, we can't. We can't. I mean, I think um, Silver Quill said it best when we interviewed him. We can't judge a show by the writer. We have to judge it by its own merits. Well, you know, I am not entirely going to do, to agree to that. Because you can ju- yeah, you can definitely judge an episode by its own merits and not by the writer. But in this TV show, we have had the same team of directors, the same team of storyboarders, the same team of voice actors. It's not like... Um, an episode of a live action TV show where you change the team every week. Like you have a different writer, you have a different director, you have a different whatsoever. You can't. Uh, the first seasons of Pony, the directors were the same. They were, they were Jason Thyssen and, and, and uh, James Woody Wooten. And in season four, we have Jason Thyssen and Big Jim Miller directing. And it is, it is noticeable because uh, that they changed to Big Jim Miller because now the show feels like, like not more epic, but darker and a bit different when it comes to tone. Like it feels, it feels more adult. It feels more, uh, it feels slightly darker and not in the, in the, oh, you're so dark. You're so adorable. No, more in like, oh my God, I think I need a new pair of pants. Kind of dark. Uh, that in, in, in that kind of sense, that, that's where uh, I noticed the, the, the change of directing. Mm. But having the same team working in all the episodes, it is comprehensible that people can judge a, a show, a, an episode, depending on the writer. 
Mm-hmm. The same way that uh, uh, even Silverquill has done this, we have judged every episode every episode written by Mary Weather Williams, and we have directed all our blames or, or praise to, to her and not to anybody else. That's the thing is that you focus your attention on the thing that is different mm, and you give praise or you give criticism to the one person that has worked in that episode and that episode alone, not in the entire series. Um, because when it, com- when it comes to the characters, how they are, it's there on the paper. That's not the work of the animator. It's not the work of the, the, the one who's doing the effects or the actor. The actor is reading the lines and is developing the character based on the lines. So when I say Dave Polsky is the best writer for reality, I mean it. The way he writes her is beautiful. And let me indulge in this because she's my favorite pony She's my favorite character in the show. She's one of my favorite characters in fiction because of how relatable she is and how incredibly complex she is that she has her own projects. She can be selfish, but she wants to help her sister. And, and, and she's like under pressure. She wants to give her best and she's worried that her, uh, her best is not going to be good enough for her sister and she wants to help. And that ends up biting her in the ass because she is like over pressure from taking the dresses to Canterlot. Uh, yeah, to Canterlot the next next day, and she almost got her loose. She could She almost doesn't do it, but she makes it, and she's so happy. And then, the, the uh, when we go to the nightmare, you can see her decline in that future vision. And I love it, but it's horrible to see it. Well, you do like to see your favorite character suffer. Yeah, I know. I love to see my favorite character suffer, but it's hard to watch. Like, if you look at that, you are like, you are like, oh my god, that's horrible. That's so terrible. Why am I enjoying this so much? <laughs> it all comes down to how well the character is written, and Dave Polk is doing an amazing job. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Two years ago, I would have never imagined myself saying this. <laughs> but I, but I say, when I say Dave Polsky is one of my favorite writers, if not my favorite writer, he is still topped by M.A. Larson, but by a very, very small margin. <laughs> if Dave Polsky does another great episode, because so far he has been hitting, he has been hitting home runs the entire season. Like, they're in done, 10 out of 10. Uh, uh, Rarity Takes Manhattan, 10 out of 10. Mm-hmm. At Twilight Time, I could have given that episode like an 8 going to a 9 out of 10, but it's still a great episode. Mm-hmm. Because, again, human-like characters... Twilight acts like a like, like 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 a real person, even though she's a pony and she's magical and animated. How can she how can she be so relatable? And this episode, ten out of ten. I mean, that's that's four perfect, spotless episodes. At least for me, how did he? Who are you? And what did you do with that horrible writer from season one? He improved. I mean, oh my god, he got so much better. I am so happy. <laughs> But anyway, James, I, I think we're digressing, and I, I think... I'm sorry, yeah. it's just... I'm sorry. I like to be credit where credit is due, and you have heard my reasons that I didn't trust Dave Polsky to come back to this TV show, and now I, co- I totally do. I I want him to stay there, to stay with, with this TV show forever. I want to see more of him. It kind of... Uh, it makes me wonder what kind of episode we would have seen in season two had he been writing for it. Oh, well, it depends on the director also, because like you said, the, the, the direction changed after they changed the directors. Yeah, it, it is definitely it is definitely true. Mm-hmm. But anyway, James, uh, I think we should wrap this one up, because uh, there's nothing much to say left, because uh, you enjoyed it, I enjoyed it, so final verdict? Sure. I mean, if you're writing for it. I am, because like I said, I, I, I think I gave all my uh, opinions on it, because... There's nothing more I could add to it, really. Well, you already, you already heard what I say about this episode. I completely hate it, and I was lying the whole time. No. <laughs> okay. Bottom line, great, mm-hmm. great, perfect, spotless. I will take this episode on. A, I will buy one of those animated frames, put this episode in, and hang it on a wall, and just leave it there because this episode was awesome. It, it's it's worth to be considered. One of the most artistically interesting, narratively intense, deep character development episodes that I have seen in this TV show. And you know what? I am exaggerating. And I am exaggerating because 
this episode is so good and I loved it and I want to show that. Yeah, I am exaggerating. Sue me. I don't care. This episode was brilliant. <laughs> All right. Well, as for me, I it was a rocky start to the episode, but in the middle to the end, I love it. It shows a cute side to Sweetie Belle when she was five. It shows a awesome side of rarity when she was uh, preventing the Felix from leaving. It shows Luna, who doesn't love Luna, and. <laughs> Sapphire Shirts when she was um, practicing the dance. That was so cool. I do love it. I, I love it. I forgot to mention how I thought that the one personality from Canterlot was going to be Octavia. I kind of like made a bet with a Sketchy. <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah, I made a bet with, with one of our friends, Sketchy, uh, to, uh, to say uh, that I said, okay, I bet that that personality is going to be Octavia. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. And he was like, well, I'm not sure. Maybe it's going to be Sapphire Shores. And I'm like, you know what? Regardless of who it is, I'm going to be happy because it's been a while without Sapphire Shores. <laughs> yeah, uh, we have been like three seasons without seeing her. So seeing her again was also a, was also a treat. Oh, that's true. That's true. I mean, Sapphire Shores is a really fun character. She is sensational. She has a mix between Donna Summers and... Mm. Tina Turner, that I really enjoy. Uh, yep, yep, yep. She's fun, she is fun. She's a great character, and mm-hmm. uh, it, it would be wonderful to see her more often. Oh, yeah, yeah. But anyway, James, what is the next episode? Okay, next episode is Leap of Faith, episode 20 of season 4, episode 85 overall, written by Josh Haber. Okay, cool. I can't wait to review this one because I am positive about it. I think we are going to have a massive contrast when people hear my opinion of that episode after oh what I said about this. Oh my. But anyway, James, let's end this. So thank you guys for checking out our episode review of For Whom the Sweet Well Toils. This has been James Cork. And I am Roman Sanzo. And we'll see you guys on the next review. Bye. See ya. See ya.